Thank you, Adele. Um, yeah, so this case study is actually dubbed uh, loosely coupled lotteries in cloudy casinos because over the last four and a half years or so, um, I have been uh, the architect of a project that we do for the Nederlandse Loterij. I'll, I'll call them the Dutch lotteries here, even though they lo don't like to be translated into English, um, where we have built an integration platform. Um, so my name is Joris Kuipers. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle here for those of you who are on Twitter. Um, as Adele mentioned, I'm the CTO of Try for Amsterdam. Fortunately for me, that is not a full-time management job. So that means I'm also a still a hands-on architect. I, uh, uh, I architect systems, but I also help to actually build them and implement them. Um, I do trainings. Uh, I have a background in Spring, so a lot of that is related to that. And today, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about this integration platform that we've provided. The Nederlands Loterij is uh, an organization that traditionally has been providing uh, a couple of different lotteries. Uh, most well-known one is the Staatsloterij. If you're living in the Netherlands, you're definitely familiar with that one. And um, they decided about five years ago they wanted to change their IT infrastructure, uh, which was very focused on uh, having just a, s a very small amount of vendors doing all of the work for them. Right? So it was like a single vendor doing the, uh, the backends and the web applications and the mobile applications and all of the handling, and it, it kept them from moving fast. So they wanted to have a more diversified landscape with the sort of best of breed architecture. Uh, that means you're going to have an explosion of vendors and systems everywhere, so they decided they wanted to have like a central point of integration for that. That's exactly what we provide. So we encapsulate a lot of details on backend systems, right? We abstract some things away. Um, and that also makes it easier to actually do replacement of individual systems. And hopefully, we have an abstraction that's good enough that clients won't actually be affected by that, or at least a lot less. Um, in terms of scale, uh, this is a very interesting project. And it's one of the reasons I'm actually presenting this case study, because this thing is huge. Uh, they have like 2 million people in the Netherlands playing with either some of their lottery games or with the sports betting, which is called Toto, or with the new casino offering. Um, so this is software at scale. Uh, very often when we do projects at Trifork, we do work on mission critical systems, but they don't necessarily involve scaling up to something that can handle a load of two million users. Um, one more slide on the project, and then I'll get into the, the tech stuff, because that's what we're here for. Um, we, the, big, the first thing I, uh, that we had to work on for this uh, project, as I mentioned, was, was getting this integration platform in place for this new IT landscape took a bit longer than, uh, than planned, not just on our side, but mostly on, on the overall vendor side, uh, getting everything there. Uh, but early to uh, 2021, uh, we went live with the final lottery game, which is the biggest one, Staas Loterij, um, and basically concluded that project. Uh, however, at the same time, a new project had already started up, because um, in October last year in the Netherlands, a new law finally came into effect. They have been working on this for years. Um, it's called Conspelop Afstand, which basically means uh, remote games of chance. And this is a law that uh, finally allows online sports betting and gambling to be uh, legalized in the Netherlands under very strict regulations. And before that, the law didn't exist, so they s sort of didn't really allow it. But it did happen, of course, because there are, especially abroad, there are a lot of companies providing services like Unibet uh, also to Dutch people even though they were not officially allowed to target them. Um, as a result uh, of these strict regulations, we had to integrate a whole bunch of new systems. It's like a bank, right? If you want to get uh, open up a new bank account, you have to prove who you are, uh, you have to make sure that uh, you're not on lists of politically exposed people, those sort of things. Uh, you have to uh, do all sorts of identity proof. It's similar, actually, when you want to sign up uh, for these new accounts here. So currently, the count of the number of systems that we actually integrate is over 30 already, and it's ever growing. Uh, so that gives you a bit of an idea. So with that having said, I want to cover two topics today. I want to talk about how we have done a division in microservices for our platform, and I want to talk a little bit about observability. And when it comes to microservices, um, I have a little quote here from, uh, from a song from Deus, a uh, Belgian band. Um, all the years before while I was blind. And this is very often how microservices are presented. 
oh, we've been doing it all wrong, and we need to move away from this monolith, and now we're in this microservices world, and now everything is great. So, so why do people say that? What are common reasons for actually moving to microservices? Well, first of all, very often what you will hear is that we have multiple teams, and they need to coordinate everything, and they're holding each other back. So what we want to do is we want to move to services so every team can be responsible for just a small set of services, and then they can interoperate without having to communicate all the time. We are one team, and this team has been growing and shrinking over time. Uh, at the top, it was like seven or eight developers, but it's always been just one team. So this has never really been a reason for us. There is a single team managing all of our microservices. Uh, another common reason is different tech stacks. Right? Maybe for one, I want to use Java. For another one, I want to use Go. I want to use some Rust. Maybe some things should just be serverless. Um, which is a very good reason if you have that requirement, obviously, to say I'm going to put them in, in independent services that I can just deploy and run by themselves. Um, we are a Java Spring shop, so everything that we have built is actually built on top of Spring Boot, and it's a very uh, straightforward stack. We actually make sure that we keep all services on things like similar versions, right? Similar versions of Java, similar versions of the frameworks that we use. So again, this wasn't really a reason for us. Um, and another important reason, and, and one that I have actually used a lot in the past to um, uh, have as a rationale for moving to microservices, is that services have different life cycles. Right? Some services might be really stable, so they, you just keep them running, and maybe a couple of times a year you do an upgrade for them. And other services change all the time, right? maybe on a daily or a weekly basis, so they have very different life cycles, and it makes sense to keep them separate. We do have some of these, but actually, the regular way that we perform deployments into production is we just take the whole thing and we just put everything there. We just replace everything, regardless of whether it really changed or not. So these weren't really reasons for us to start doing microservices. Um, now, what I want to show you is why we did actually move to microservices and why, for us, this has been a very uh, good move. Um, basically, when we started this project around five years ago, Microservices were all, uh, all the hype, right? And I was discussing this with my team, and I said, guys, we could just really build this as a monolith, and I could see the disappointed look in their eyes. They said, okay, okay, we'll move to microservices. Also, I like talking on, uh, about this stuff on conferences, like I'm doing right now, right? So that's a good reason. Um, and you can put this stuff on your resume. We have been using Spring Cloud, we've been using Netflix open source stack, we're running on Kubernetes, super cool. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say about why we moved to microservices. So thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, Adele can check if there are any questions in the app. But I'll take them. And that's, uh, that's going to be it. No, obviously not. Obviously not. Sorry. Um, but <laughs> uh, what I want to make sure that I bring across is that whenever you choose microservices, you need to first think about what are the reasons for you? What are the problems that you are trying to solve with this architecture? Um, before I go into that, first let me show you our actual architecture. What we have is something like this, where we say we have three types of services. We have experiences, as we call them. Those are the public APIs. They provide APIs to clients, JSON over HTTP, which some people might call REST, but I won't go into that. Um, and we have a lot of these different experiences. And typically they are fairly light, right? They are really just a dedicated API aimed towards specific clients, and then they talk to a process layer. These process services provide lots of business logic. They do orchestration. They know that we need to interact with multiple backends or we need to perform multiple operations on the same backend. Uh, they do error handling, rollbacks, that sort of thing. And as you can see at the bottom, we have system services, which basically act as dedicated adapter services to various backends. And we have these in verticals per domain. So we have a logical, a couple of logical domains within this whole landscape. We have a player domain with player accounts. We have a game domain that has knowledge of all of the lotteries. We have a subscription domain that knows about how to interact with subscriptions. But we also have things like how to uh, send invoices to retail shops that actually sell paper lottery tickets. Uh, we have ways to integrate with a general ledger, right? These are all very different application domains, and we call them verticals, and we end up with a system like this, where you can see that we can actually have multiple experiences calling into the same process, a process can call to multiple system services, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we do this? Well, there's, um, there's reasons for doing this at development and for runtime. So at development time for us, what this means is that you as a developer, you don't have to run the whole thing, right? 
um, it's super annoying if you're working on a big project that this project is actually a single server, right? Then you're going to start it up, you're going to have a cup of coffee, you come back, and then you can start working, right? It's like working with a web server application server for some of you who have knowledge on that, right? It says open for e-business after five minutes. I don't want that. I want a developer to be able to just run locally what's necessary for this story that they're working on, basically. But not only running that, actually also knowing that this system that we're doing, it's an integration platform for the entire organization. That means that it's huge in terms of the domain. I am one of the few people, maybe the only one, that still oversees all of it because I've been involved with the project from start to end. I don't want everyone in my team to have to know everything about everything in order to be able to work on this thing. Uh, it's very important for us to say, oh, when this new project came in for all of this uh, casino and live sports betting expansion that we needed to do, that we can just hire two additional developers, which we did, um, and they can be productive within a day because they just need to know about this little encapsulated domain that they're working in, and they don't have to know anything about lottery games if they're not working on lottery. They don't have to know anything about retailer invoicing or about managing terminals in retail shops, right? Because that's not the thing that they're currently working on. And that's super important, actually. It means that we have this, like, a collection of systems, and you only need to deal with the understanding the part that you're actively working on. Um, also, what we found is that having these dedicated experience APIs as dedicated services provides a really nice level of granularity for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, security. Right? If you're going to provide a service that is tailored towards one or just a small number of dedicated clients, um, then you can make sure that from a security point of view, you can just provide those clients with something like a scope that actually matches that experience service. If we want to, we have the opportunity to go more fine-grained, but typically we don't have to. Typically it's fine to say, okay, we're going to grant you access to one or two experience APIs, and that is what you are allowed to do, and you're not allowed to call any of the other experience APIs, and these clients typically don't even know that these other APIs exist. It also means that these APIs will be fairly focused, right? As if you are a vendor who needs to integrate with our platform, you don't need to understand the world and everything, and then figure out, oh, but this is stuff that's relevant for me. No, you're actually getting something that's already tailor-made, focused on your needs. Um, and that also means that for us, as we are developing these APIs over time, they are expanding, um, it's much easier to keep them compatible for these clients. We are not building public APIs that serve thousands of unknown clients across the world. We are dealing with a known set of vendors who is integrating with us. Right. If we want to make changes, typically we will make sure that they are backwards compatible. But if we do need to make things like breaking changes, we know who our clients are. And if that's focused then to a particular service only, it makes it much easier to coordinate these sort of things. So it has a lot of benefits there. Most important reason for us, although, uh, was not really the development benefits of doing microservices. It was really the runtime benefits. Because this is actually uh, one of the very few systems that we're working on at Trifork where being able to do scaling individual parts actually matters at runtime. This is not that often. Very often when we're building systems and we need to scale up, we just say, yeah, fuck it, just take the whole system, deploy it five times, put a load balancer in front, and <coughs> scaled up. Which is fine if you are dealing with maybe a couple of thousand users, right? And if you are, by all means, just do that because it really works very well. In our case, this is not really true. If there is a state lottery draw on the 10th of every month, we get over a million people in the Netherlands at 10 o'clock in the evening exactly who we'll all want to check if they won something. So exactly at 10 o'clock, we see this huge ramp up and we see literally a million people logging in and then checking if they won the lottery. Right? And if the system works, they will be able to see immediately that they didn't. That's how lotteries work. Um, we see the same thing with, with soccer matches, right? Or maybe I should say football, depending on who's actually watching this video, but this will be on YouTube. I'll say soccer. Um, the same thing happens, right? People start, start actively uh, logging in and interacting with these games. Um, also, by having different services, we limit the blast radius if something actually crashes. Um, of course, nothing ever crashes because of mistakes that we make, but there might be mistakes in the things that we use. Right? We have actually had some cases, for example, with we had a third-party library for doing syslog over TCP IP uh, to uh, propagate a login event to a third-party security system. 
This was their requirement, and I found a library that could actually do this called syslog4j. It sounded good. It was actually from a, a big uh, company that open sourced it. So I thought, okay, it has seen a lot of production use already. Let's put that in. Turned out it had a memory leak because it had an unbounded buffer there where uh, before actually sending something out, it would just put it in a linked list. Right? It was unbounded, which is terrible. It was also a linked list, which was also terrible. Uh, I had to rewrite the whole thing. But um, if this happens and you, got, you run out of memory and your thing gets restarted, it's really nice if this is at least limited to one particular service rather than to the whole thing. Um, also, um, even though, as I mentioned, for regular deploys, we deploy everything, it is really nice to be able to just say, I want to update this one thing, either in a staging system or in production, without affecting anything else. We can do ad hoc deployments. Sometimes if we have like a critical bug fix that needs to go out now, I can just push a new Docker image, I can update my Kubernetes deployments, and it will just do a rolling restart of this one service. And I, I only have to see if that is OK. And I only have to monitor for changes on that part. I don't have to worry about the whole universe that is Nederland Sloterij there. That's actually kind of nice. So as a result, every service that we build is in fact a Java Spring Boot application. We deploy on AWS uh, to Kubernetes. Nowadays, we migrated from ECS to Kubernetes, which is a different story, uh, but we're there. And uh, when it comes to communication, these services talk to each other over HTTP or using point-to-point -point messaging. Uh, Amazon provides a service called SQS uh, that we use for async communication, for retries, that sort of thing. So it's a combination of these two things, basically. Um, the way that we've set up our project is it's a mono repo. It's a single Git repo. It has, uh, nowadays, I think, something like 32, 33 different services in there. There's a bunch of shared libraries in there. Um, and we built them with Gradle. Uh, this may sound very heavyweight, right? If you have to check out something and build it, it's over 30 services. And it is huge. It's a lot of lines of code. Um, now, we have chosen Gradle for a number of reasons, actually. And this is like Vim versus Emacs. Right to Maven versus Gradle in Java, uh, but obviously, uh, like Vim versus Emacs, the answer is easy. You have to use Vim and you have to use Gradle because with Gradle um, you get build caching, and for us, a typical build takes less than five minutes. And what this thing does is it compiles everything, it runs all of the tests, and we do actually have tests, so it's not like it's fast because we don't. Um, it will then also build all of our Docker images, and it pushes out all of those Docker images to repositories within those five minutes. And that is because everything is efficient. Gradle will know if something didn't change, I don't actually need to rebuild it again, it's just there. Our Docker images are set up in such a way that we don't include files that will automatically change on every build, like putting in a timestamp there. So if something doesn't change, we actually end up with a new Docker image that is literally exactly the same as the previous one. And Docker is smart that way. When you try to push that image to a repository, it will just do some, some checks based on, on hashes, on checksums, and says, hey, you know what? I already have this thing. I just need to re-tag it. So it's super efficient. So that means that a setup like this actually works very well, even though you might be tempted to think that this is becoming like, very inefficient, very slow to work with. So um, in practice, a lot of services that we have follow the architecture that I've shown. So they have a nice experience. They have a process. They have a system. Um, and uh, in, in general, uh, what we do see is actual reuse of our process services. So we do see multiple experiences calling into the pro same process service, which is how we designed this architecture. So it's nice to see that this actually works as we hoped it would. Um, however, um, this is not something that we strictly enforce. Uh, there are quite num a number of exceptions to this rule. Um, I like to call myself a pragmatic architect or developer which also means that I'm old and I'm cynical and I will just do stuff because I can. Um, but in this case, we have some good reasons for doing this. So, uh, for example, these dedicated system services that I showed, we found them to be very beneficial only for certain backends. If our backend is like really big, we, in we interoperate with it on many different levels, uh, it's central to our domain, then it makes a lot of sense to say we're going to have a dedicated system adapter. It acts sort of as a DDD anti-corruption layer, really. Um, so that's one use case for it. Also, because we're using messaging, what we found is for certain systems, our only interaction with it is by sending a message to a message queue, picking up the message, and then calling the third-party system. We never do it runtime in a blocking fashion. It turns out that it's really nice to have dedicated system adapters for those as well, because you can just take them out, you can redeploy them at will. It's all right, it's all asynchronous anyways. Um, 
So uh, an example of this is the, uh, the marketing system that we use for sending out emails. Right? We only interact with it through messages that we put on a queue, and we have a dedicated system service for that one. Also, that one needs to be limited in the amount of runtime instances because we're only allowed to send that many requests in parallel, and that's another good reason for encapsulating this in its own service. Finally, we're tech. Right? I mentioned TechStack as a common example for uh, choosing microservices. We do actually have some systems that just have like a weird requirements on a technical point of view for interacting with them. We have to integrate with an Azure event hub. It's called Slack Kafka, but then from Microsoft. Um, and they provide the Java SDK. And when I saw that, I thought, ah, that's nice. I don't have to do it myself. It actually, underneath, it uses AMQP, which is a messaging protocol. Uh, but what they've done, they've, they've used Project Reactor which is for reactive non-blocking I.O. And then they've just put a blocking API on top. And that's the SDK that you get. And it's like the worst of both worlds, right? Uh, you still are blocking, uh, but now you lose all of the context when you actually call this thing and it starts logging because uh, well, you have no idea what thread it actually uses. And, and it's buggy in the beginning. It's, it's better now, but in the beginning, we've actually seen some problems with this thing. It would just not rebuild connections, that sort of stuff. Just Get it out of the house. I don't want it here, right? You can sleep in the backyard, or as we architects like to call it, we have isolated the service. Um, but if this is not the case, right, you don't necessarily need a dedicated system service. Just use a process, and the process can just talk to some backend directly. And it's interesting because yesterday we had a talk here about uh, progressive delivery in microservices from, um, from Matt Turner. And, um, he was actually showing an architecture where they were building, as in his company, they were building system adapters for literally everything, even stuff like a database. They have an architecture where everything internally is just gRPC, and if they need to talk to a database, they just put a small adapter in front of it, uh, actually not typically written in Go, because apparently the Go ODBC is like a hack, so they use something real, like .NET or Java, to actually interact with the database, and then they just put a little API in front of it so that they can send SQL over gRPC to it. It, it made me think about something, that, because I would never think about doing this, but I'm not saying it's wrong. What I'm saying is that apparently I'm still thinking in like an old enterprise Java architect, I think in bigger systems, whereas this stuff that, that Matt presented is truly cloud native. So it got me thinking actually last night, I said maybe I'm not cloud native, maybe I'm more like a cloud expat. I wasn't really born here. I just come here to work, and uh, I get to, uh, to actually complain about all the things I find really complex in this, in this cloud environment compared to where I came from. Um, also, I get to make fun of all of the little idiosyncrasies and, and it's weird stuff that they do in this cloud native world. And, and, and somehow I pay a lot less taxes than the natives do. No, that's actually not true, but uh, I would actually like to use this opportunity here in GoTo 2022 to introduce this new term, cloud expat, right? If you don't feel you're just ne not there yet in terms of cloud native, and I'm just one person, but I think together we can actually do this, right? So go out on Twitter and introduce the cloud expat there. This is not my talk. I have actually some more stuff. Um, there are some services where it just doesn't make sense to split stuff up at all. So it's just a single service that does everything. Um, for example, we have technical services. If someone needs to obtain a, a bearer token to interact with our system, they need to log in. There is a system for that that just goes directly to a identity provider. Uh, we have some business services, for example, for integrating with a general ledger or for sending invoices to retailers. Those are just completely self-encapsulated. They are their own thing. They don't really benefit from any distribution in terms of uh, process layers or, or system services like that. The good news is, of course, if you start with a single service, you can always extract stuff later, right? Sometimes people have mentioned or explained the term architecture as it's the stuff that turns out to be hard to change after the fact. That's your architecture. But it's called software for a reason, right? We can change a lot of things quite easily. Uh, a related term that you may have heard is last responsible moment, right? What is the last responsible moment that I can defer a decision to before I make the decision? And it turns out that for a lot of these choices, your last responsible moment is after actually already running your system in production. I can do this, and I can make this change later on, and nothing will be hurt, right? I don't have to s stay up at night thinking, oh, maybe I got this wrong. You can make these changes after the fact, right? So don't worry too much about these things as you are designing your system. Just keep reevaluating if stuff still makes sense for you. So as a result, 
we have some services that are fairly tightly coupled. Right? An experience talking to a process, they share a common contract. These are, by design, these are tightly coupled services. Some others are more loosely coupled. Maybe they just have a couple of messages that they use to interact, and that's it. And we have some services that are just completely independent of other services. Right? They could just be deployed on even to a different cloud if you want to, uh, and it would still work. So there, there are different levels here. And we are very happy, actually, with the results here. So we have happily coupling in our applications here and there, but it's by design. So what I, the point I want to make here is that you can have happy coupling if it's with full intent and if it's consensual. Um, and what we've seen is that this system is still expanding, right? We, we have been using this architecture now for almost five years, and it's really serving us very well. So this is something that I want to give you as food for thought. Now, there is another thing I want to briefly talk about. Let me quickly see how briefly that will be. Uh, we have time. Um, because once you build a system like this, and you put it in production, it is crucial that you're also able to observe what it actually does. Right? So you've probably seen this before, if you have been to conferences like this, right? the three pillars of observability. We're dealing with logging, individual events, saying something happened. We're dealing with tracing, seeing how calls actually propagate through our system of services. And we have metrics that are more like pre-aggregated statistic explaining things on a higher level. So when it comes to logging, by default, most people just log using a log pattern to a file or something like that. And that works well for local development. It doesn't scale at all if you want to go to centralized logging. Right? It's lossy. You see here things like uh, packages being abbreviated. It's also really hard to parse, especially with Java and stack traces. Oh, all of a sudden, this thing is now multi-line. Is that still a single log message? There are tools that can deal with this, right? but there are sort of fixing a problem that you don't even supposed to have, because what you should be doing, you should be using structured logging. That can be JSON. That was actually a recent discussion on Twitter for, uh, about doing binary logging. I'm not going to go into that one. Most people use JSON for this. Um, but that means that you can just ship this off. You can have all sorts of fields. Obviously, it will have the stuff that you would expect, like the timestamp, the actual log message, the log level. But you can add additional fields as well which is really important. So uh, this is one uh, simplified example of our actual log configuration that we have in our system, where you can see we're using this thing called a log stash encoder. And this will actually ensure that you get JSON-based logging. And what you can also see is that we put additional fields in here. So we put the name of the service in there. We want to know, whenever we send a log message off to our centralized logging system, what was the service that was responsible for coming up with this log statement. Um, also, what you can see here is that this is uh, just a console appender. So we are writing this stuff to standard out. But the way that this works with Docker is that there is just another agent that will actually pick up that logging that is produced by your container. Um, and in our case, that's going to be a Datadog agent that just forwards these logs off to Datadog, which is the observability solution that we happen to use. Right? But that's important to think about. Contextual information is super important when you think about logging. And another way to add contextual information that's more dynamic than just a service name is MDC, and this is like a pet peeve of mine. I've put this in this presentation because I still, after 15 years of explaining this stuff to people, see that people don't know about this. And you need to know about this. Right? MDC is a very simple concept. It's like a map, key value pairs, that is associated with the currently handled request, typically by storing it on a thread local. Um, and you can put in stuff here like, what is the current user? Um, what is the current request that we're actually handling? What is the current batch job that's running, right? Maybe if, if that is what you're building. Um, so you see an example here of how simple it is to use this stuff. What we do here is we get the current request URI and we put it in a variable. So whenever we have logging, we can see, okay, what in what context was this actually produced? What URL were we handling when we were performing this logging? And it's really just three lines of code. Um, another thing that is really important for us is tracing. So tracing is the idea of saying we're going to create a unique ID whenever a request comes in, and we're going to propagate that to downstream services. And we're using Spring Boot uh, with uh, support for something called Spring Cloud. And part of that Spring Cloud is something called Spring Cloud Sleuth that actually does this for us. So this requires no coding. This is just a matter of adding some dependencies. And then this is in place. But this for us, this is super important to be able to correlate logging. Right. We want to be able to see if we actually have an experience calling a process, calling to system services, that all of this logging was actually done in the context of the same logical request that was being made. 
What we also do is these trace IDs that get generated, we put them in response headers, so we send them back to our clients. So if there's a problem, they can come to us and they say, can you check the logging for this trace ID? This is not only nice in production, but this is especially nice on staging environments, right? How often do you have people coming up to you when you have a development or a staging environment saying, yeah, yesterday we noticed a problem with your system. It was somewhere around 4 o'clock. Can you have a look in the logs to see what happened? And you start looking at the logs around 4 o'clock, and there's like 5,000 messages. So you say, well, no, I can't. Fuck, go fuck yourself, right? I cannot do this. But with this, what we do is we make everything unique. So we send back a unique trace ID, and a client can simply tell us, hey, what happened for this particular trace? And with a single click, we can basically look up the correlated log. Our testers do this as well. This is awesome for end-to-end -end testing, and then the problem occurs. Someone needs to figure out, okay, what was it actually that caused the problem? We can see exactly what happened. I'll give you, I'll give you a demo at the moment. Um, with tracing, the idea is that when you go from one service to another, it actually adds multiple spans, as they're called. So you have a trace made up of multiple spans. You can export these to systems that allow you to inspect them. There's a whole range of solutions for this nowadays. We don't actually need this, really, so we don't do this. We just use trace IDs for logging at the moment. But if we wanted to, we could also expose these traces to systems for further analysis, for example, to find common bottlenecks or something like that. But we have other ways of doing that. So I want to give you like a really quick demo just to give you a feel for this. So I have a link here. This will, take, uh, this will take us to an acceptance environment, actually, that we have. Uh, I hope, if anything happens. Let's see, because it's... There we go. So um, what we go to here is the acceptance environment of our, uh, of our application. And what I've done is I've done a little search. You can see it over here, based on a barcode. Uh, because we had an error related to this barcode. And I can uh, see that, actually, I found an error. Uh, I can see the URI, right? This is my MDC logging. I can see, okay, we apparently we're handling some, some product order results uh, request, and I got an unexpected error. Um, and the unexpected error said, uh, in this case, here, there was an exception. And uh, if we look at that one, we see that the backend said, this inquiry is not allowed for the current pack, right? Whatever. But we, we know that something went wrong. But we don't know exactly who requested this or whatever. We do get a lot of additional context, though. If I look at this, I do see the trace ID here. This is the thing I was talking about. So what I can do is I can copy that trace ID here. There we go. And I can open up a new tab, and I can say, OK, for the acceptance environment, I want to see the trace. This is just a bookmark that I have with a placeholder. Put in the trace ID. And this will just take me to all of the correlated logging for this particular error that I just had. So you can actually see here, if I zoom in a bit again. OK, we, from bottom to, to top, because that's the ordering here. Uh, someone arrived at an experience. From there, we called uh, a, a process layer, which is called a system layer. We can see all this stuff in place. Now I can also see who made the request, because in our experiences, I also log things like the client ID. And if I look over here, I can actually see that in this case, we had a client ID there. That's also resolved into an actual client name, and it's Datadog doing this. This is another nice example of log information, right? Our system doesn't know about these names. It just knows about client IDs. But I can actually ask the logging system itself to say, just have a map so that you can enrich that into something that humans can read. Also, there is an awful lot of debug logging here, way more than a typical system would have. Uh, because uh, we actually uh, show every request that we're making to a downstream service and the response. That's not something I would advise you to do on every request. That's a huge amount of logging. So why is it happening here? Well, if we look at this sending method, then what we can see is that there is a little request header over here. You can see this gateway log request and gateway log response headers set to true. This is another very useful trick. What we have done is we have allowed clients to send an additional request header that will trigger additional logging in our system. And you can use this, especially in production scenarios, if by default you're not logging something, but you want to reproduce an error and you want to have more information on what's happening than you get with your default logging. So you can just enable per request debug logging. And if you have something like trace ID propagation, typically your framework will just allow you to add something called baggage headers, which will automatically handle the propagation of these headers so that it just doesn't only work for the first service that handles your request, but also for all of the downstream services. Right? So that's some tips I wanted to give you for uh, working with logging. Um, in addition to this, we do metrics. 
Metrics is very different because where logging is just a single event, metrics are pre-aggregated. So like every minute, um, we gather information on what was the average request time for handling an incoming HTTP request or for outgoing HTTP requests. There are JVM level metrics. There's actually a whole bunch of them. And most of them are built in. We don't have a lot of custom metrics. A lot of this is just built into the framework. And what's nice about these things is they are enriched with tags or dimensions, as these things are called. So it's not very useful to just know how long did it take to handle all requests on average in my system. Now I need to know, OK, but what service was this request for? What URL? What was the result? Was it the 200 OK? Was it a 500 internal server error? All of this stuff, I need to be able to filter on that so I can do some, um, uh, some actual analysis of my data. And this is exactly what metrics provide. And um, for me, it was sort of an eye-opener when we started using this, because this is the first system I've ever used metrics on a large scale. And I'm never going to build any system without metrics again. Right? These things are so extremely useful, both for technical reasons, but also for business reasons. Right? Because if you can see how often a certain endpoint is being called successfully, that also tells you like, how many tickets are we actually selling. Right? It's the same metric, basically, or at least in our case it is. So that's really something I can recommend you uh, to, uh, to look into. Um, they scale much nicer than logging because they're pre-aggregated, so you can easily keep like three months worth of metrics. We don't do that for logging, it would be way too expensive. It's also way faster, right? These systems that deal with metrics are very good at rolling them up, aggregating them over a larger period of time. So very quickly you can do some ad hoc dashboarding with them. They're cheaper to store, uh, and like I said, it provides tremendous insights. So I don't think I actually have time for a demo for metrics. No, but if you're interested in that, uh, please come and find me after the presentation. I would be happy to show you some actual production metrics, which I'm not very happy to actually put on video here, uh, but show you some production metrics of the system that we're working on. It's truly interesting stuff. So to conclude, um, reasons for actually wanting to move or to adopt a microservices architecture very greatly. And you shouldn't be looking for reasons to adopt microservices, you should be looking at the problems that you have and that you want to solve and then decide, oh, microservices might actually be a good way to do this, right? Don't listen to people like me talking at conferences and just saying, yeah, you should be doing this because it worked for us. And they say, oh, that's nice, I'm going to do the same thing because your use cases and your problems are not mine. Fortunately, they're not mine. Um, so understand what matters to you. Also, make sure that you can observe your systems. It's super important that you have contextual information in your logging, that you have metrics available, and also make sure that you as a developer can actually see this stuff from production. I still s talk to people, typically they work for banks, where they say, yeah, uh, if there is an issue, I need to file a request to some change management system, and then some operator actually gives me the logging. Quit your job if this happens. They trust you to write production code, but they don't trust you to see how it actually acts in production. This, there is no feedback loop. This is, this is killing, right? So quit your job. And if it so happens, we are hiring at Trifork Amsterdam. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in learning more about some of the things we do, because this, this talk is just 40 minutes, and I could talk about this for a day, um, come and visit me after the... Uh, I will be here all day uh, at the conference at the Trifork booth. And uh, thanks for attending. <laughs>